How do you build an ideal? How do you shape the land to foster your ideal vision of societal organization? These are questions that one of America's premier architects had to answer at the end of the Revolutionary War, when the Continental Congress charged him with planning the development of new Western lands given up by Great Britain, France, and Spain. The architect could easily have replicated the designs of those monarchies. Like London, Paris, or Madrid, newly formed states could have had a central capital city with roads extending radially outward and ringed by concentric roads, like a spider web. The function and symbolism of this design is clear. All roads lead to the throne of the monarch at the center. But this architect had to reject that design. That's because this architect was Thomas Jefferson. His pen had declared independence from monarchy to start the revolution. He could not now use that same pen to reproduce an ideal of monarchy in the design of America's new lands. Jefferson had to draw the lines that would empower an independent and expanding population to build a radical new ideal, the ideal of democracy. The design that Jefferson drew was perfect for this purpose. It was a grid, a series of lines dividing the land into equal parcels exactly one mile wide by one mile long. 36 parcels in a six mile by six mile grid would form a township, and multiple townships would form new states. For Jefferson, the ideal of democracy would disperse power away from any single central ruler, so the grid had no center. Democracy would promote equality of opportunity for every individual, so every parcel in the grid was initially identical. Democracy would depend on an educated citizenry, so each township had one parcel reserved for school buildings. Democracy would encourage participation in local government, so every township had another parcel reserved for government facilities. Jefferson even hoped that the grid could discourage the spread of slavery by making it difficult to acquire enough contiguous land to build a productive plantation. As the lines of this continental grid began to be drawn across the Northwest Territories from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River, the rationality and fairness of the grid's design must have seemed to be self-evident. But these lines were not drawn with a pen. They were drawn with an eraser. The grid was designed for land that was unowned and unoccupied, but this land was not empty. It's true that there was no competing claim by any other government to this land. The European nations had ceded their claims, as had the American colonies, which had been granted vague sea-to-sea -sea claims by the King of England. The king had based these original claims on the fact that he was a Christian king, and the natives occupying the land were heathens. With a chain of custody carried from Christ to the king to the colonial governments to the Continental Congress, the Congress felt justified in claiming all of this land as its own. Despite their presumed privilege over Native Americans, European and colonial governments often purchased land from them in order to secure peace. However, there may have been some confusion over what was being purchased. Native Americans had a different concept of land ownership, believing that certain uses of land could be bought and sold, but not the land itself. After selling a plot of land for farming, they might have expected to continue hunting on that land. They also viewed these usage rights as temporary since they move frequently. Other complications included tribal leaders selling land that was owned by families, not by the tribe, or selling land where another tribe had a conflicting claim. These types of misunderstandings, along with broader conflicts of interest, often escalated into armed skirmishes along the colonial frontiers. In an attempt to reduce such conflicts, King George III had prohibited colonial settlement in the Northwest Territories after acquiring them from France in 1763, reserving that land temporarily for Native Americans until it could be settled in an orderly fashion. But this did not stop some individuals from forging into the Northwest Territories to build frontier farmsteads in what they viewed to be either unowned land or Indian land they could purchase directly. They marked boundaries, put up fences, cleared fields for farming, and built their homes. In European legal tradition, these types of improvements to the land could establish ownership rights, so they may have believed this homesteading was legitimate, regardless of the proclamations of some distant king. These pioneer settlers were a problem for the Continental Congress, 
who did not recognize their land claims and derisively labeled them squatters. In 1783, the Continental Congress re-established King George's prohibition on settlement. But they had a stronger motivation than reducing conflicts with Indians. As eminent American historian Puff Daddy has described it, it was all about the Benjamins. For Benjamin. At that time in America, land speculation was big business. The sea to sea land claims of the original colonies had been granted by the king not to individual citizens, but to monopolized for profit trading companies that promised land to settlers who worked for them. As settlement expanded, other private companies formed to claim western lands and sell them to individual settlers for profit. In the late 18th century, land speculation companies laid claim to large portions of land in the Northwest Territories, which they had purchased from various Indian nations. However, they couldn't do anything with this land until their claims were recognized by the colonies, in particular Virginia, who still asserted the sea to sea claims in their royal charters. Before the Revolutionary War, the land speculators had unsuccessfully tried to persuade King George to recognize their western land claims over the claims of the colonies. After the war, they took their case to the Continental Congress. Many members of Congress were sympathetic to the land speculators, because they were the land speculators. Several notable congressmen, including Benjamin Franklin and Patrick Henry, were either members of these companies, paid by the companies, or bribed with stock ownership. Both of Maryland's congressmen were members of a land company, as was the governor, and most other Maryland state leaders. In a blatant abuse of political power for personal gain, the Maryland congressmen refused to ratify the Articles of Confederation unless Virginia agreed to cede its western land claims to the Congress, believing that Congress would then grant their company's claims. As esteemed American historian Scooby-Doo has described it, they would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for that meddling Virginia congressman. That congressman was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson believed that Virginia and other states would be better able to defend the land claims of individual pioneer settlers against competing claims by the politically powerful land speculators. He eventually acquiesced and ceded the land to the Congress, but on the condition that the land speculators' prior claims be voided. The result was to create a monopoly for the Continental Congress over all sales of new land in the Northwest Territories. The Congress would auction off this land to raise money to pay its war debts and fund its expansion of power. Jefferson's Continental Grid would be the mechanism of accounting for these land sales, turning the American continent into an ATM for the exclusive enrichment of the Continental Congress. What happened to the other competing claims to the land? The land speculation companies lost their investments and lands purchased from Indian nations, but they gained something much more valuable, a means of legally purchasing large parcels of land from a single seller without negotiating with the confusing network of Indian nations. Furthermore, the land they were selling would now be protected by the strong Continental Army, at the expense of the Congress and taxpayers rather than themselves. The so-called squatters pioneer farmers who had homesteaded and improved undeveloped land, were not as fortunate as the speculators. Jefferson had been prescient in predicting that the Congress would not protect their land claims. The Congress did send an army to the Northwest Territories, but rather than protecting the American settlers, it turned its weapons upon them, forcibly evicting them from their homes and burning their homes to the ground. But this was a display of mercy compared to the eventual resolution of competing land claims by Native Americans. Colonists and Indians maintained an uneasy coexistence into the early 19th century, even as the spread of colonial farms made the Native American way of life dependent on hunting in large forests increasingly difficult. Some Native Americans adopted the colonial lifestyle of independently farming a small plot of land, and even became naturalized as American citizens. After two decades of the grid's expansion into Indian lands, the president saw this assimilation by Native Americans as a key to peace with them and a resolution to the settlers' insatiable demand for land. He wrote, 
Our system is to live in perpetual peace with the Indians, to cultivate an affectionate attachment from them by everything just and liberal which we can do for them within reason, and by giving them effectual protection against wrongs from our own people. When they withdraw themselves to the culture of a small piece of land, they will perceive how useless to them are their extensive forests, and will be willing to pair them off from time to time in exchange for necessaries for their farms and families. In this way, our settlements will gradually circumscribe and approach the Indians, and they will in time either incorporate with us as citizens of the United States or remove beyond the Mississippi. That president was Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson put this benevolent love-it-or-leave-it principle into practice encouraging citizenship for Native Americans who wished to assimilate as farmers. For those who wanted to maintain their traditional way of life, Jefferson proposed having Indian nations voluntarily exchange their crowded territories east of the Mississippi for open lands west of the river, made possible by his purchase of the Louisiana Territory. No one took him up on the offer. Over the next three decades, American settlement increased tensions with a few remaining Indian nations in the East. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson turned Jefferson's concept of citizenship or relocation into federal law with the Indian Removal Act. Jackson believed that the Constitution required Indian nations within state borders to be subject to the laws of the state and federal governments, rather than coexisting as sovereign nations. He sent negotiators to leaders of Indian nations to secure their agreement to either become citizens under state law or relocate to reserve lands west of the Mississippi and modern-day Oklahoma. While this was in theory voluntary, the Indian nations likely believed that the federal government would eventually strip them of their sovereignty with or without an agreement. The land swap deal was their last chance to preserve their sovereignty and culture even if it meant moving a thousand miles away. In autumn of 1831, the Choctaw in Mississippi was the first nation to sign a treaty agreeing to have the federal government relocate them. They were given only two weeks to gather their crops and sell their land. Flooding made planned wagon routes impassable. While waiting to be crammed onto steamboats, food ran out. One group's steamboats were commandeered by the U.S. Army. While waiting on shore, food ran out and a Tennessee blizzard set in. With little clothing or shelter, many died from pneumonia or froze to death. Another group's steamboat broke down and they disembarked at the wrong location. There were only 12 wagons for the elderly and small children. 3,000 people walked 150 miles over three months. Food ran out. Starvation and disease overwhelmed them. They stopped frequently to bury their dead. Flooding forced another group to disembark with no wagons or food. They walked 30 miles through swamps up to 3 feet deep. Cholera broke out. To avoid spreading the disease, bodies of cholera victims were burned on the roadsides. One Choctaw chief described his harrowing journey as a trail of tears and death, a phrase that would be applied to similarly disastrous removals of Cherokee and other Indian nations over the following decades. Alexis de Tocqueville, the French observer of early America, witnessed the Choctaw removals firsthand. He asked one Choctaw why they were leaving America. The response? To be free. How do you build an ideal? An architect draws the lines of his ideal design on paper. But an architect doesn't build anything. The means and methods by which his design is brought into reality are the sole responsibility of the constructor. If built with improper means, the soundest structure can collapse, the grandest facade can look garish, and the purest concept can be perverted. Jefferson drew his ideal of democracy with the best intentions to disperse the power of undeserving elites, to empower individual citizens, and to honor the rights of all mankind to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But the means and methods used to build these ideals were antithetical to the ideals themselves. They were the methods of government. They were the means of force. Instead of dispersing power, the method of government seized the power to monopolize land sales for the benefit of well-connected land speculation companies. 
instead of empowering citizens, the means of force evicted citizens from their homes and burned those homes to the ground. And instead of honoring the rights of all mankind, the threat of being ruled by Jefferson's ideal of democracy marched the ancestral owners of the land to their disgraceful deaths, men, women, and children. And in their place came the grid. The Continental Grid now covers three quarters of the continental United States, but this design was not drawn with a pen, it was drawn with an eraser. It is an inescapable net cast over the continent, the erasure of all that came before and all that might have come in its absence. Rather than dispersing governmental power, the grid places a powerful federal government squarely at every intersection, extending in every direction, endlessly to the horizon. Where should we draw the line to build a radical new ideal? An ideal of an architecture. Welcome to the second episode of An Architecture, exploring the built environment of a stateless society. My name's Tim. I'm an architect living in Boston. And I'm Joe. I'm Tim's brother. I'm an engineer living in Adelaide, South Australia. In the last episode, we defined the built environment and discussed a bit about how to visualize that using a framework which we call the scales framework by zooming into different spatial and time scales to see what sort of changes happen at each of these scales. Today we're going to jump to the second part of our slogan, which is the stateless society. In the last episode, we defined anarchism or a stateless society as a society without a government. So the next thing we need to do is to define what a government is. And just for clarity, there's a distinction between government, which could be seen as a function, and the state, which is really more the actual entity or the group of people who typically perform the function of government. However, like most people, we'll tend to use those two terms interchangeably, and generally from the context, it should make sense what we're talking about. So a definition for government that I like to use is an organization that has legitimate authority to initiate force against people without their consent. So there are really three parts to that. We said they have legitimate authority, they initiate force, and without people's consent. Okay, so the first part of that that we'll discuss is the concept of initiating force. So what we mean by force in this context is specifically physical force against another person. And so initiating force in its simplest form is essentially who threw the first punch. And just to be clear, the use of defensive force would not be considered initiation of force. We can discuss a bit later in a bit more detail why we treat these two types of force differently. For the next part of this definition of government, we said that governments initiate force against people without their consent. So what consent means is that it's possible to agree to let someone else kick your ass. So for example, if you're a football player or a boxer, it's implied or possibly, I don't know, you sign a waiver or something. That makes it clear that you understand that the other person is going to be coming after you and you're going after them. And, you know, that's all in good fun. Outside of the realm of sports, it is also possible to have contracts between different parties that could ultimately allow force as a penalty for not performing some action. So, for example, if someone makes a down payment on a car and the other guy never delivers the car, then person A would be perfectly within his rights to use force in order to at least get his down payment back from the shady car salesman. Well, if that was a condition of the contract. You know, if ultimately that was a penalty for this guy not delivering the car. So you'll see as we go along that when we start talking about anarchic solutions, a lot of the times we will depend on contractual agreements between people to define norms of behavior within those relationships and within society as a whole. Yep, and the key here is to ensure that consent is always present with these contracts. All the contracts need to be entered into voluntarily. Right, and the other part of that is that people really can't be under duress when they are consenting to something. So, you know, if someone's got a gun to your head and you sign something, then no one should really consider that as a legitimate form of consent. And the third part of this definition of government, or the state, is that it's considered to have legitimate authority to initiate force. This makes a distinction between a government 
and something like a street gang or the mafia, which might go around initiating force on people all the time, but people don't consider those people to be justified in what they do. So the difference is it's really one of public perception of whether or not the group of people calling themselves the government is essentially allowed to do what they're doing when they do use force. Yeah, and it's not that they would necessarily wouldn't be allowed to do it. I mean, they're going to do <laughs> they're going to do what they're going to do. What makes it legitimate is that some majority of people accept its initiations of force as either moral or at least kind of maybe a necessary evil, you know, something that's practical in order to maintain order or, and provide certain services within society. So just to recap that definition, because we're going to keep coming back to it, government is an organization that has legitimate authority to initiate force against people without their consent. So what's really critical here is this concept of initiating force and when that is considered to be right or wrong. So when we talk about the government initiating force, of course there's examples like maybe starting a war or police brutality or something like that that you know, a lot of people would consider to be wrong. However, this initiation of force is really inherent in just about everything the government does. Now, this doesn't mean that your garbage man is going to come and beat you with a baseball bat every time he picks up your trash. However, it does mean that in order for him to get his paycheck, somebody's taken some money out of your paycheck with or most likely without your consent. Right. So the thing that distinguishes government from most other organizations is that government's really relying on a threat of force for its funding, for many of the services that it puts in place, and for many of the policies that it establishes. The most probably fundamental of this is taxation, where every dollar that the government earns for itself has been taken from someone under a threat of force, which is what taxes are. So, you know, everybody fills out the paperwork and, and pays their taxes once a year or four times a year or whatever it is. So you don't see that force on a day-to-day -day basis. But the reality is that if you did not pay your taxes, just follow the, the chain of events that might follow. So let's say you don't pay your taxes. First, they'll send you a letter you know, notifying you that the taxes weren't paid, and then they'll probably start sending you fines, and then those fines will probably increase and increase. And then eventually, if you're not responding, maybe they'll send you a subpoena for a court date. If you don't show up to court, they'll probably send someone with a gun to your house to take you out of the house and bring you into court. And if you don't cooperate with that person, then things could get ugly. <laughs> Yeah, so let's just say that those guys wouldn't consider any force you use to be defensive. Right. I mean, that's, you know, when, when a cop comes to arrest you from your house, if you don't comply, they are able to initiate force against you in order to get you to comply. So if police come to your house to take you away, under the current paradigm, they have the authority to initiate force or certainly threaten force against you to convince you to come out of your house. And ultimately, if you... You know, God forbid, if you resist in some way, then that could end up being deadly force. And on a less severe note than that, there are other consequences too, where if you're not paying your taxes, the government could put a lien on your house and essentially take your house out from under you. So just as a counterpoint to that, you can imagine if some local mafia thug tried to do the same thing, tried to take money from you, and then if you didn't give him the money, came to your house threatening to break your kneecaps, you wouldn't really be okay with that and most other people wouldn't either. So here this, this really illustrates the difference between someone that uses force who claims legitimacy and someone who does not have legitimacy, at least in the eyes of the public. Later in the episode, we're going to revisit this scales framework that we established in the first episode and explain at each scale of the built environment some examples of how government initiates force at each of those scales. <laughs> So then let's talk about what the difference is between the government, let's say, and the mafia. How does the government maintain legitimacy? And one point to make here is that consent and legitimacy are really two sides of the same coin. Consent means that you say it's okay for somebody to initiate force against yourself. And legitimacy means that you think it's okay for them to initiate force against somebody else. And so people need a consistent way of deciding which uses of force are legitimate? And this is the fundamental question behind political theory or political ethics. There are a whole variety of different ways that governments can maintain legitimacy or that 
the people who support governments can convince themselves that those governments are legitimate. Probably the most common justification for just about any use of force is a utilitarian one, which is essentially the ends justify the means. This can be applied in a few different ways. The most general sense is essentially that the majority of people benefit from whatever action it is. There are other ways to employ this sort of thinking as well, such as the notion that something is okay as long as someone benefits but nobody is injured. Right, so when we talk about the ends justifying the means, the ends are the things people want to achieve, uh, whether it's things like you know public education or defense, things like that, all the things that we think of government as doing. And the means, as we've talked about, are this initiation of force. So it's a question of when is it legitimate for the government to initiate force to achieve all of these various ends that people want them to achieve. Another reason that people tend to legitimize governmental actions is out of fear. Governments and certainly the media are very good at fostering fear in people over one thing or another. Oftentimes it's of some enemy or some possible future enemy. Of course, there are some real threats out there. So if people feel that they're threatened by something, whether it's real or imagined or maybe a future threat, they're going to be willing to initiate force or have their government initiate force to try to prevent or stop that threat. It's so one thing that governments tend to do is to monopolize certain services that are perceived to be public goods, which essentially means that people don't think these goods will be provided unless they're provided by the government. Examples of this are defense, judicial services, public education, aid to foreign countries, consumer safety watchdog services. This could extend to the government providing services that are really more than what is really required by any public goods argument. The textbook example is the Roman bread and circuses. Essentially, if you keep people fed and give them something to watch, they won't revolt. So an example of how government monopolizes services, again, we can talk about public education, where you don't need government to provide education. People generally want their kids to get educated, and there are people who want to teach, and certainly people can arrange to provide those services on the market. Of course, there's been a long tradition of government not only funding education for people, but even building the buildings, hiring the teachers, and managing the whole system. And not only that, but they do it all at no cost to the students. What this means is that if someone else wants to come in and try to compete with government, that they either have to be so good that people will want to pay for their services above and beyond the services of the school, um, even after they're already paying taxes to support the public schools, and so, of course, the result is that the only people who can really afford a competitive education or an education that's competitive with the government education is people who are very wealthy. So that means that everybody else becomes dependent on the government school system. And, of course, once your kids are in the school system, then you're going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that that system gets supported and that it gets funded and that it won't go away. And that you won't have to pay for it directly. So people generally understand that when there's a competitive situation, that competition alone tends to limit the power of each group that's providing services within that market. When there's a monopoly, then people seek other means of limiting the power of that organization so that it provides the services they want and does so efficiently. And this is especially true of government where when the service that the government is providing is force, Obviously, there's a much stronger incentive to find ways to limit that power or at least to define clearly when that can and can't be used. And so governments realize this, and so they tend to establish controls for themselves that can give the people some degree of confidence that they won't abuse their powers. In medieval times, this limitation may have taken the form of the people storming the castle with a guillotine and uh, threatening to chop off the king's head if he didn't if he became abusive of his powers. In more modern times, we've seen devices such as a, a written constitution, which specifically spells out and limits the powers that the government has. In a constitution document, one of the primary things that they'll try to do is to separate power so that you have different groups of people who have authority to approve various actions that the government does. So this is intended to create a system of checks and balances where no one person or no one group of people uh, can really get out of hand. And another way that these powers are dispersed is through a system of federalism where there may be more local branches of government who have more control over their particular regions, which in some ways can act as a balance to the powers of any central government.
And this idea of dispersing power is taken even further in the idea of democracy, where individuals get to vote on certain policies as well as elect representatives to represent their interests at various levels of government. So in modern democracies, we tend to see all of these elements. They tend to have a constitution that will define and limit the powers of a central government, local or state governments that reserve powers for themselves separate from the federal government, and a democratic election system where ultimately the people in charge at each of those levels are to some extent controlled by individual voters. So again, the effect of all these systems is that it builds confidence in people that their system of government will act appropriately and act in ways that they will believe to be legitimate. So what I've just described is really the ideal of democracy that we talked about in the introduction, where you have a system that most people tend to think is fair and probably the best system possible for managing a government. However, it's important to remember that even in a democracy, Governmental actions are still an initiation of force. Even when the majority of people have voted for something, there's always a minority of people who has voted against it. So essentially, there's always someone who's not getting what they want. And of course, voting for something alone doesn't make it legitimate or right or moral. There's the expression of two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner. In democracy, you tend to have a majority rule with um, a significant number of people who might not be getting what they want. In the 2012 election, I think Obama had something like 51% of the vote. Romney had something like 49% of the vote. But of course, what those numbers don't show is how many people didn't vote. If you calculate it out, something like 42% of people didn't vote, which means that less than 60% of people did vote. So the actual numbers of people that actually voted for Obama and essentially consented to him being the president is less than 30%. So that's hardly a majority even there. And so, of course, the corollary to this is that close to 70% of people in the U.S. have not shown any desire to have Obama be their president. (laughs) Not trying to be partisan here, because I'm sure Bush's numbers were even worse. And I'm sure that goes back all the way to probably George Washington. Let's say that Obama actually got 90% of the vote, right? 100% of the people voted, and 90% of the people voted for him. I mean, that would be a huge landslide win, right? there would still be 10% of the people who weren't getting what they wanted and weren't getting their ends met. And just to restate what I said before, even if 100% of people vote for some action that's an initiation of force, that doesn't necessarily make it right. So 100% of people could vote to invade Canada tomorrow. That would mean that that's the right thing to do or that that's legitimate, at least by most people's standards. But a democratic system might allow that to happen. You got my vote. Let's get those (laughs) bastards. (laughs) Australia's next. (laughs) And so an example that really illustrates that voting isn't necessarily an expression of consent is, let's say, two guys mug you in an alley and they give you the choice of getting kicked in the nuts or punched in the teeth. Now, if you make a choice, have you actually consented to this? And the flip side to that example is that voting also doesn't necessarily make something legitimate. So if those two guys, rather than giving you the choice, if they ask 10 other people standing around you and those people vote on one of the options, does that make it legitimate? So of course these examples are a little bit absurd. The thing that's missing is that there's someone who's affected by the choice, but the effect on him is disproportionate to the influence that he has on making this decision. So what we've tried to establish here is that Democracy is not a perfect system for limiting or or even legitimizing the initiation of force. Even within a democracy, there can be pretty grievous abuses of the initiation of force. The example we gave in the introduction was the policy of forced Indian removals from colonial lands, which resulted in this trail of tears where something like a third of the population of some of these Native American tribes died just in the process of moving from one place to another. And so one thing that democracy has proven to do very effectively is to legitimize government actions in the eyes of the people because they feel like they do have some sort of an influence on the actions that the government takes and that that in turn limits the powers of government. And not only that, but if even if people themselves didn't vote for a certain action, they feel that they're participating in a fair process whereby some other majority of people has chosen to partake in a certain action, 
So even if it's not what they want, then they think that that decision has been arrived at fairly. So they'll be more willing to accept it. The core problem that underlies even a system of democracy is the notion that there's some sort of one-size-fits-all solution that everyone has to be shoehorned into the same system or into the same set of rules. So we've been talking about some of the flaws in democracy, and just to be clear, democracy is probably the best of the current governmental systems or the current or historical governmental systems that have been tried out there. Certainly dictatorships and other more oppressive governments um, are worse than democracy. We're just making the point that even a democracy, which a lot of people believe to be a really good system of government, has some pretty serious flaws. Getting back to the theme of our first episode, where we talked about the idea of permanence and that the system that currently exists is perceived to be unchangeable or the most appropriate system, it really takes some thinking outside of the box to achieve something better. To better illustrate how governments initiate force in a variety of different ways, we're going to revisit the scales framework that we set up in the first episode, where we described spatial scales of your immediate environment, your house, your property, your neighborhood, a metropolis, a regions, and ultimately the globe. And so like we did in the first episode, we're going to zoom out, but this time around we're going to, rather than just explain to you what a house is, we're going to try to take a look at how governments initiate force at each of these scales. The first scale we talked about was your immediate environment, where we're focused on you as the individual and the immediate space that you're acting or working in uh, at any given moment. In your immediate environment, if it's just you, there's no initiation of force because there's nobody else to initiate force against you. So let's move up to the scale of the house. So one question we want to ask at each of these scales is to have you think about, would you ever initiate force in each of these scales? So when we're talking about your own home, would you ever initiate force in your own home? I think most people would recognize that that would be completely unacceptable to use force against your family or your friends who are in your home. Not to mention impractical, where you may get what you want momentarily, but it's unlikely to, uh, to ensure that you're going to get what you want later on. Right, it's going to destroy any lasting relationships or lasting potential for um, cooperation with the people that you're aggressing against, who in this case, if you're talking about your house, would most likely be your family. So in a house, since there are relatively few people interacting, you generally don't see too much third-party interference for the most part. It doesn't mean that there are no effects from government policies or regulations or anything like that, but in terms of the direct actions, you don't really see a lot of direct force happening. Right. So the next scale we talked about was your property. And the distinction here was that, for one thing, the property deals with the exterior environment as well as boundary conditions. So again, we'll ask the question, would you ever initiate force on your own property? Probably the most likely situation where someone might use force on their own property would be in the event of some sort of a trespasser or burglar. However, the, the amount of force that someone would use is generally limited to the amount of physical threat that exists against them. So, for example, when you see a sign that says something like, trespassers will be shot on sight, that's pretty disproportionate. If you figure it could just be some kid trying to take a shortcut across the yard or something like that, you know, obviously that, that would be a ridiculous reason to shoot someone. However, if it's someone like a violent burglar who's looking to break into your house and possibly harm you or your family, you'd probably feel well within your rights to initiate some force against that guy. Yeah, and the way I think that you can justify the initiation of force against somebody who is threatening you is, look, if somebody comes onto your property waving a gun around, they're threatening you. So to me, that expresses that they've consented to have you initiate force in turn against them. Or essentially, they've already, by threatening you, they're essentially initiating force against you. Right, right. And so you, you're within your rights to defend yourself against that force. And so another factor that plays into this is the immediacy of the danger. So essentially there, there needs to be some sort of clear and present danger in order to really justify the use of defensive force. By Harrison Ford. By Harrison Ford. Or was that one Clint Eastwood? <laughs> no, I think, it was, I think it's Harrison Ford. <laughs> yeah. Clint Eastwood doesn't need a reason to use force. 
So a governmental solution to the problem of trespassers, or let's say dangerous trespassers, would be to call the police, where then the police are going to come to your house, and rather than you pointing a gun at the guy who's on your property, supposedly the police are going to come and point a gun at the guy on your property. And then of course, that would probably be about 15 or 20 minutes or so after the guy has already done whatever he's going to do on your property. As they say, when, yeah, when, when seconds count, the cops are minutes away. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and at the same time, essentially the same principles that, that would determine whether or not it was okay for you to use force personally would really apply to the cops in this situation as well, where they shouldn't have the right to shoot someone just for you know, cutting across your lawn or something like that. However, again, if the person is proving to be a, a, a viable threat, then, of course, the, uh, the cops would feel more justified in actually uh, using force against him. Right. And in theory or, and, you know, to the most part in practice, police have a very well-defined system by which they can or, sh- or should not escalate force. So, as Joe mentioned, this is concept of a clear and present threat. They do have a variety of guidelines that they follow to make sure that their use of force is in proportion to the threat and the immediacy of the threat. And, of course, there could be individual officers who don't necessarily always follow these rules or who maybe make poor judgments in the heat of the moment uh, because they don't fully understand the situation. But we're not really focused on that sort of thing on this podcast. There's plenty of other sources on the web to find outrage porn for stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, the, you know, the point is, whether it's cops or, or, or anyone else, I mean, anybody who's taken it upon themselves to use force as a means, certainly for defense, but really for, for anything else, you know, as we've talked about all these uses of the initiation of force, anytime you're using force to get what you want, there's always an opportunity for that force to be misused. And when you're talking about deadly force, um, any misuse of that force can really be tragic. So that's one reason why those of us who believe that the initiation of force is wrong choose to believe that. Because once you've said that it's okay to initiate force, it's very hard to maintain a proper proportionality of force and there are often unintended consequences of any use of force, whether it's justified or unjustified. Okay, so you can see that at the scale of the property, uh, there's a bit of a qualitative change with the sort of force that might be used, and you can start to think a bit more clearly about the right uses of that force. So now, expanding out from there, we can go to the next scale, which is a neighborhood. And so this is where you might be interacting with your neighbors, whether that's voluntary or involuntary. So the question to ask here is, is if your neighbor is doing something that you don't like, would you go to his house and threaten him with force? So for example, if if your neighbor's out and their teenage kid is having a party and they're making a bunch of noise at two in the morning, uh, would you walk in there waving a gun around trying to get everybody to shut up? Now clearly in that situation, there's there's, uh, not exactly proportionality of force. Although that, that is a bit of a, there are a couple of factors to consider there, which maybe we'll come back to in a minute. Yeah. So again, you can imagine that very few people would take the step of going to the neighbor's house uh, with a gun to, you know, to quiet down a party. But most people at that point would not hesitate to call the police to bring their guns to the house to quiet people down and, and maybe kick them out and make them all go home. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there where something that people don't hold as moral or proper for their own behavior, they condone and consider to be acceptable when the government does it. Which essentially means if they hire an agent to go do it for them. And the fact that it's the government and has that legitimacy generally makes them feel okay with it. Right. And again, just to be clear, we're not, we're not trying to bash on cops here. It's, yeah. it's not like the cops are going to go into the house and start waving their guns around. <laughs> but whenever you have the police involved... People understand that police are authorized to initiate force if needed, and if the situation gets out of hand, then they could do that. And so this example is is a little bit more complex than simply you don't like something that's happening, and so you go over there and start waving a gun around. Because really the reason that you're going over there is because there's noise from that house which has essentially trespassed onto your property and into your house. And that is essentially a violation just as if your neighbor was releasing some sort of toxic gas or something that drifted over into your yard and, and started uh, harming your family or killing your plants or something like that. Of course, with noise, it's typically much less damaging. However, if it's disturbing your sleep, then there could be uh, some health consequences. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not just the consequences. I think it's, this is kind of a broad definition of force where we said that it's, you know, using f- physical force against people. I mean, noise from a neighbor's property at, in the middle of the night will affect you physically. So that is essentially a, a type of initiation of force, of physical force. But as Joe said, it's, it's certainly not proportional to, um, to threatening somebody with, with bodily harm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there are some cultural or social norms here that define when something like noise is or is not an initiation of force or a violation. So if somebody gets up and is mowing their lawn at 8 o'clock in the morning and those teenagers from the party the night before are trying to sleep in, you know, I don't think that most people would, um, would respect the teenagers' complaint about noise at that point. So essentially there's societal norms that develop where people come to understand what's generally acceptable behavior and what isn't. Oftentimes, the social norms of when something like noise is or is not acceptable get codified within laws that are created by governments. So, for example, they might say that you can't have a sound level of, you know, 60 decibels crossing your boundary line after 8 o'clock p.m. or something like that. And so once these laws or ordinances are established, the need to keep them simple and easy for everyone to understand, carries with it a consequence that it tends to be sort of a one-size-fits-all approach. So, for example, for a noise ordinance, you could imagine there are special situations when people will generally ignore it or expect that it doesn't apply. For example, if there's a public holiday and there's a fireworks display or something like that and everybody can hear the fireworks. Typically, where ordinances like this get enforced is at the level of the metropolis. So again, the metropolis, we said, is a collection of neighborhoods that are interacting with each other within the framework of a a larger city. So at the scale of the city, obviously you usually have a city government. The big problem that we've stated with city governments is that they're funded by taxation, where they are threatening force against everybody within that city to give them money so that they can do all the things that they want to do. So that's one obvious way that force gets initiated by city governments. The way that ordinances like noise get codified at the city level is usually through zoning regulations where city governments will define broadly or narrowly how land can be used within different areas of the city. So they might say that one area of the city is uh, for residential use, one area is for industrial use, one area is for commercial or retail use. And then within each of these zones, they'll define a number of regulations that govern what activities people can do within those zones. So for example, something like noise, they might have a higher threshold for allowable noise in an industrial area and a lower threshold in residential areas. Something like noise is really the the justification for zoning laws where they're trying to minimize adverse impacts from various land uses on their neighbors. But that said, oftentimes you see zoning laws abused, or in my mind they're abused, where they're starting using them to define things that don't qualify as an offense or initiation of force against somebody else, where you know they're, they're telling you what the design of your house should look like within a certain neighborhood, or what color you can paint it, or what colors you can't paint it. Right, exactly, or whether or not you can have you know, garden gnomes or, or political signs out on your property. Or that weird glass sphere thing, <laughs> or the Virgin right. Mary in a bathtub. All right. <laughs> Who doesn't want that, though? And so more broadly, additional laws might be made to attempt to control pollution, but the mandate of government could also be expanded to include victimless crimes such as drug use or, I don't know, nude sunbathing. But that's a little bit outside the scope of the discussion that we're having in this podcast, so we'll move on and try to keep it a bit focused. The point is that there are a variety of different ways that governments initiate force at the level of the metropolis that no individual would take it upon themselves to do. So this is where we can ask the same question that we've applied to some of the other scales. If you wanted a regulation or a service to be provided in your city, would you go around town with a gun collecting money from people forcing them to take the garden gnomes off of their front lawn. Right. So as we've said before, one of the main things that separates government from any other institution is that they claim legitimacy on the right to tax people, which means that they're taking money from people under threat of force or imprisonment if they don't pay. So 
there are very few situations where if if you don't pay a debt to somebody, they'll come to your house with guns and take you out and then throw you in a cell block. And and likewise, you wouldn't do that to somebody else. At least you shouldn't. And to be clear, you know, the debt that's owed to government is pretty arbitrary to begin with. There's some justification for paying fees for use of various government services, such as roads and things like that. But by and large, systems of taxation are not proportional to the use of government services. People don't actually know what they're paying for any given service that government is providing because everything's lumped into this one tax payment. Now, you can get online and find out what the actual expenditures of the local government are, and you can sort of apply that to what, how much you pay in tax, but given that most taxes are based on either income or property value or something like that, or even spending, what it really means is that each person is paying a different rate to use the same service. Yeah, not only that, but you know, if you think of something like school, where um, if you decide to send your kid to private school, you still have to pay the taxes for the public schools in the area. Or even if you're somebody who doesn't have a child, you're still paying the same amount as uh, the people whose kids are being funded to go to government schools. And public schools are an example of a service that the government provides. A bit earlier, we, we discussed about how provision of certain services was one way that, that governments maintain legitimacy among the public. And so at the metropolis level, you start to see a number of these sort of services, whether it's roads, public transport, sewage systems, public water systems. And at this scale, it does make sense for a lot of these types of services to be provided at a large scale so that instead of everybody having a septic system in their backyard, they can install a common sewer system and a single wastewater treatment plant that will do a much better job of cleaning up that sewage and in the long run probably be more cost effective for everybody. Yeah, and that's a good example of something that in some cases the government might take on and, and provide that services, but in other areas might be provided by a non-governmental um, organization or business. Another example of that is something like transportation, where if you're somebody who believes that government has a proper role to defend people from threats, to make laws, to run courts, to manage police, something like transportation is kind of outside of that scope of services, where there are really lots of, of options for transportation that people could take advantage of. And yet, in many areas, we see government providing public transportation systems, or I should say governmental transportation systems, where people are being forced to pay through taxation for a large transportation system that they may or may not use. Right, and with public transportation, there are probably some cases where poor people who might live in the inner cities are effectively subsidizing some of the richer people that live out in the suburbs and who commute to work using that public transportation every day at a discounted rate. Yeah, and one argument for having government provide services like transportation is if government doesn't provide it, then poor people won't be able to afford it. But to me, that's conflating a problem of poverty, which is very real, with a need for transportation or schooling or any other service that the government provides. I mean, put simplistically, the way to deal with poverty is to give people money. And then they can use that money to pay for their transportation or whatever services that they want. But the way governments often do it is rather than just giving a few people the money that they need to cover their basic needs like transportation or education, oftentimes government will monopolize an entire industry ostensibly to ensure that some minority of poorer people are able to afford those services. And where people would generally not accept a private entity creating the same sort of monopoly for any of those basic services, like a transportation system, when, when the government does it, they feel that the government will act in the best interests of the public in owning and operating that business. This is very similar to the concept of legitimacy that we've been discussing, where essentially the fact that people might have a, the right to vote for some sort of upper management of whoever's running the train system, or at least makes them feel like they have some sort of ownership over that service. Right, but in reality, the same incentives or disincentives for a monopoly to improve quality and reduce cost over time, those same disincentives are there, whether it's a government or private organization providing some service. And in fact, when the government is providing monopoly, there's even less motivation for them to, as I said, improve quality. They can lower costs, or at least lower costs to the users, 
but oftentimes you see costs escalating to the people who are actually paying for the services, which is the taxpayers. Because the people using the service aren't the ones paying for it, or at least they aren't paying full price for it, you lose the mechanism of price determining how resources should be allocated to improve services or reduce services where they're more needed or less needed. And of course, if it were a private monopoly, you would at least have this mechanism that would drive the decision-making behind the provision of services. Right, and ultimately, even if a monopoly wasn't running a business efficiently, there's a good chance that something would come up to compete with that monopoly and drive it out of business. Either that or it might, through poor management of finances or whatever, it might need to file for bankruptcy on its own and then someone else could buy up those assets dirt cheap and operate it at a lower cost basis. Right, so the point is that a government monopoly has all of the problems that any non-government monopoly would have in providing a service in terms of their ability to respond to consumers' needs, improve quality and services, and reduce costs over time. Right, and even voters don't really have that much influence on how these services are, are actually operated in real life. For example, when was the last time that you voted for the train commissioner or for the sewage treatment czar? So in contrast to that, of course, there are other examples where governments um, provide for the needs of the poor without monopolizing an entire industry. One example of this is with a very basic need, which is food. Obviously, everybody needs to eat, and there are plenty of people who can't afford to eat. The way that government responds to that, at least in America, is they give people food stamps or vouchers to go out and buy some amount of food that they need. This allows the government to adjust what they're spending on each person based on the actual needs of that person and allows everybody else who doesn't need assistance to participate in a normal market. So for example, government doesn't go out and start opening up grocery stores where all the food is free in the grocery store and letting everybody come in and take what they want. Um, obviously, you can imagine where that would go pretty quickly. People would just come in and raid the shelves and, and there would be nothing left, so then they'd have to come up with other means of rationing things. So for example, in the Iron Curtain era in the Soviet Union, people would have to wait outside in bread lines so that rather than rationing things by means of price, they would ration things just by means of taking up people's time, essentially, where you'd have to wait there until more food arrived at the shop. And similarly, today in places like Venezuela, where the, the state has a monopoly on supply of food, the food's all free or very cheap. Uh, however, there's none of it on the shelves anywhere. So in that example of the provision of food, it's obvious that it would be a problem for government to monopolize the selling of food. And yet people seem to have a hard time making the same connection to services like transportation or education, where you have the exact same mechanisms at work. So it doesn't really follow that the company that provides your sewage treatment services is the same one that needs to be educating your children. However, this is generally accepted by most people as just the natural way of things, just because of the way that these industries have developed in many places. And so when you put it that way, you can, you can see that there's really no specialization there. There's no divisional labor. And at the same time, there's no real pricing feedback system or incentive system for each of those industries to develop and evolve specifically to meet changing customer needs. Yeah, not only that, but the people who are running those services at the top of the ladder are people who have absolutely no expertise in those industries. So most city councilors have probably never driven a bus or never taught in a classroom. Or never cleaned out the bottom of a sewage digester. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, that might be a good thing to uh, get those guys doing. <laughs> yeah, that ought to be a prerequisite for uh, getting into office. <laughs> yeah. They talk shit all day. They might as well clean up a little bit of it. Oh. To come back to the example of education, if you imagine providing education services the way that we provide food services or food assistance services, you could have a very different educational system developing. If rather than making school free for everybody and having the government build the buildings and hire the teachers and create the curriculum, you could take all of that money that's being spent on an education system and just give the money to people who can't afford education on their own and then let them choose which school they want to go to, and how much tuition they want to pay. You could imagine this even with the existing school system. The only thing you would have to change is rather than having government pay for all the expenses of school, just have government redistribute their education funds to all the students who want to go to school, and then each of the schools could charge a tuition for their services. 
if you made this transition, in theory, on day one, nothing would change. You could still have all the same schools running. The costs could all be the same. They could still be getting paid the same amount of money. But this would allow the market to open up for other education providers to come into the market and start providing competing services for education, which might be more specialized for the individual needs of certain students. Right. And of course, there are private schools that exist now, but they tend to be more in the higher cost range, which crowds out most people from accessing them. Part of the reason for this is that lower cost schools are crowded out by the, the free public schooling that's provided by the state. So you can imagine that if that schooling was no longer free, but people actually had money to spend on school, that a whole market would open up for lower cost private schooling to meet all kinds of different needs. Okay, and so you can see how once you get to the metropolis level with the size of the population that's there, uh, we really start to see a lot more of these government programs and a lot more presence of government. So you can imagine that as we move out to the next scale of the region, where there's even a larger population spread over a larger area, the government structures that exist there are even further removed from each individual. And really, each, each individual person has less and less influence on what the government does at these larger scales. However, the impacts of the decisions that the government makes could possibly be even larger on some individuals. As we've been discussing at the scale of the metropolis, Many government services are essentially monopolies that just serve to redistribute wealth in one form or another from some group of people to another group of people. When you get to a larger region, we see these type of wealth transfers happening over much broader areas. So somebody in Massachusetts might be paying for a bridge to be built in Alaska. So at a larger scale, like a state or a national government, one of the main roles that that government plays is this redistribution of wealth between and amongst various cities and regions. And again, if we come back to this question that we keep asking, if you had some service that you wanted to be provided in your area or in your region, would you hop on a plane, fly up to Alaska, point a gun at somebody there, take their money back, and use that to provide that service? It sounds pretty ridiculous when you put it that way, but that's more or less how redistribution works. And so the type of services that are typically offered at the level of a region, which for the sake of this argument, we'll just say, assume that it's provided by some sort of national government. These are services that effectively span across multiple metropolis areas or multiple sub-regions, such as states. And one example of this might be something like a, an interstate highway system that provides roads from one side of a country to the other through different states. Another might be provision of defense services against foreign nations, and we'll discuss that one further a little bit later. Another service that a federal government could provide is to resolve disputes between different states. So, for example, if someone from Florida bought some maple syrup from Vermont, and it turned out to be nothing but pitch, and uh, someone from <laughs> Vermont bought their oranges from Florida, and they turned out to be lemons or grapefruits, then they would need some sort of third party to go to to, to arbitrate that dispute. Under current systems, that, that would typically be some entity of the federal government, such as a, what do they call it, a, a district court. Since it's typically in the interest of pretty much every business in a particular industry to achieve this sort of standardization, it's not really necessary for the government to be the one who provides enforcement or who, who lays out what the standards are. And there have been plenty of examples throughout history where this has happened. In fact, a lot of what become Legislated standards for industries often start as de facto standards that are arrived at within each industry privately. And we'll get into this a bit more in a future episode. Right. And just to be clear, the reason that the federal government is jumping in and trying to standardize these regulations is because you had state governments in the first place imposing their regulations on the industries. So if you didn't have all of these state governments making these regulations, there would be a much more natural tendency for businesses to standardize over a broader area. And industrial regulations can also be used to favor a particular region over another. We see this most often in the case of something like tariffs, where, where any goods coming into a certain region have to pay a tax that wouldn't be applied to a similar good that was produced within that region. And when we start talking about multiple regions, that really brings us out to the next scale of the globe. At the scale of the globe, governments often establish regulations similar to they might in their own region. This tends to take the form of agreements between various national governments. 
So as an example, a handful of governments might get together and write up an agreement with each other that they're going to establish regulations in each of their own countries to try to limit vehicle emissions uh, to control air pollution. Businesses in that in industry may favor this international standardization over federal standardization for the same reason they prefer the federal over state regulations, you know, because it gives them a more common set of standards to work to. Right, and it's not necessarily that they want these international regulations. It's just that they don't want multiple different and sometimes conflicting national and state regulations. They'd rather just have one set of regulations or standards that they need to abide by as they provide services around the globe. Right, so for example, in Australia, cars are much more expensive than they are in some other places because, uh, for one thing, you've got the steering wheel on the wrong side. So that's you know an example where they essentially have to build almost a separate production line or at least a separate process uh, in order to manufacture that car compared to the cars they manufacture for the other 70 or 80 percent of the world that drives on the correct side of the road. When we start talking about whether businesses want or don't want a certain kind of regulation, whether it's at the national or the international scale, it's worth noting that sometimes larger corporations may actually want certain types of regulation to be applied at a larger scale because this might make it harder for some of their smaller competitors to comply and therefore to compete with them. So an example of this might be a car manufacturer who is promoting a regulation to increase restrictions on vehicle emissions. They might support this if they themselves are planning to reduce their emissions anyways, and if they know that their competitors will have a hard time catching up with them on their efforts to reduce vehicle emissions. Right, and this could be the case if... For example, one manufacturer is based in a country that already has more strict requirements than other countries do, and so essentially they're already building cars to that standard. However, the cars being built somewhere else need to increase their price or increase their cost basis in order to meet that standard. And this again relates to the issue of tariffs, where a local manufacturer may push for high import tariffs on their product, and what this does is essentially prevents any foreign competitors from competing on the same on a level field with them so that this allows them to keep their price higher than it might otherwise be. But of course the trade-off there is that if one nation institutes tariffs on another nation, most likely that other nation is going to turn around and create some similar tariffs that apply to, to the first nation. Right, and when that happens then really it's the consumers in both nations who are paying more for those products and having less choice. Of course nations don't only control goods that cross their borders, they also control what people come across their borders, or at least they try to control what people come across their borders. Some of the reasons why governments enact these immigration controls might include protection against dangerous people such as terrorists, prevention of the spread of disease, and they may also just be striving to manage a particular population level where they have concerns, or where at least some people within the government have concerns that overpopulation could become a problem or that the existing infrastructure services that are available within the nation, within the region, are not sufficient to support an additional number of people who might try to come in. Yeah, and one of the common arguments you hear against immigration is that, you know, they're taking all the jobs away. So governments might set quotas for how many people in a given year can come into the country and be allowed to work, out of fear that if too many people come in, then, then they'll drive down labor costs and the citizens who already live in the country will have less opportunity to do the jobs that they want to do. Or to do the jobs that they're currently doing while maintaining the same standard of living. And to elaborate on Joe's point about the infrastructure being able to support a large influx of people, of course one of the reasons that people might immigrate from one nation to another is that they may be able to get more benefits from the government in the nation that they're moving to. So, for example, in the United States, there are a lot of immigrants who come from Mexico for a number of reasons, but certainly one of them is that they have access to better health care within the United States, and they generally don't need to pay for it because hospitals are required to treat anybody who walks in the door. So having a large welfare system can be a source of tension between the taxpayers whose money is used to fund a welfare system and the potential new recipients of that welfare who may come from a different country. And this is probably the main reason for the amount of animosity that is often displayed towards immigrants or illegal immigrants 
However, this is essentially another case of the government patching up a problem that it has created. And so for these reasons, immigration is quite a hot button issue. So we don't want to spend too much time on it here because it's not really the, the focus of what we're trying to cover. Um, I imagine that we'll discuss it further in some future episodes. It is often true that nations that border each other may develop a variety of disputes or tensions between them, and sometimes these disputes can ultimately result in the two nations going to war with each other. And these tensions between neighboring regions can sometimes escalate to the point where one nation might attack the other one, and uh, then you've got a war on your hands. So wars can be started and justified for a number of reasons. Historically, they've often been a means of one nation gaining territory, gaining resources, or gaining new subjects, which essentially increases their tax base. And so with this sort of economic conquest, it's really not much different than the case of the the burglar coming onto your property, which we discussed earlier. So again, most people wouldn't view these reasons for starting a war as legitimate, especially not the people who are in the area that was being invaded. Because of that, another reason that some nations might get into war is to protect people in one nation from what they view as an oppressive government that's invading from another nation, or possibly an oppressive government within their own nation. And so going back again to the analogy to the property scale, this is a little bit like someone calling the police to come help them out to get the burglar off of their property. And as we said before, The fact that violence is being used in this situation could lead to a a disproportionate use of that force. Yeah, and it's often the case that as soon as the word war is mentioned, or as soon as some conflict is described as a war, uh, then it's like all bets are off for, for what they can do in terms of the use of force. Again, of course, there are rules of engagement, but there tends to be a, a much higher tolerance of collateral damage and violent means of achieving some end. And just to put this in perspective, you know, let's say that there was a gang war going on in Detroit. Could you imagine if the federal government came in there and started firing Hellfire missiles all around Detroit to solve the problem of gang violence? I don't think too many people would be on board with the violent obliteration of one of their own cities for the supposed purpose of stopping violence. And of course, if they dropped a bunch of bombs on Detroit, would anybody really notice? (laughs) It's like if a tree falls in the woods. So anyways, no one would consider it to be appropriate for the United States government to drop bombs in its own country. You know, but when they want to go and drop bombs on some little town in Yemen, it's like people think, well, of course, that's how you, that's how you deal with problems over there is by just, you know, showering them with a carpet of flaming democracy rained down from flying killer robots. Well, if you did that to Detroit, that might actually be an improvement. <laughs> yeah, right. And save on some of the demolition costs. <laughs> but in all seriousness... There are real people out there getting bombed. And one result of this is the radicalization of people, where essentially if you see someone you know or or even someone who just you closely associate with because they're from the same city as you, and you hear about them being killed by a foreign military strike, it's pretty unlikely that you would regard that as a legitimate action, regardless of whatever led up to it. Even when the alleged purpose of a military strike by some other country on, on your soil was to bring you more freedom or to save you from either your own government or some other invading government. Once your city is attacked, it doesn't really matter what the reason was for that attack. It's going to be pretty hard for you to get on board with the country who is attacking you. And they might not even have to attack you, even if they're just moving in and and occupying the country. More often than not, people resent having a foreign military presence within their borders. And this alone is enough to turn people against that occupying nation, and in extreme cases, to take up arms against it. And coming from an American perspective, there have been some events over the past couple of decades where many Americans have been killed by some sort of bombing incident. And in response to those incidents, many Americans became willing to launch military actions against some foreign countries who they believed to be at least partially responsible for these events. And while America's foreign policy doesn't necessarily justify any of the sort of terrorist actions that we've seen happen in America, by examining these events, you can develop some sort of empathy for the people in these other countries 
who feel like their only option is to do something extreme, such as a terrorist attack. Certainly in response to the 9-11 attacks in America, the country became very unified behind a new war effort uh, in Afghanistan and somehow also in Iraq because people saw that as an appropriate and necessary response to an attack on their own soil. So you can imagine how people in other countries feel uh, when their countries are attacked, especially when they're attacked by uh, a nation that has a disproportionately powerful military. So when a goat herder in Afghanistan sees missiles being fired from a flying drone airplane into his rural village, you can imagine the animosity that that breeds in people who otherwise probably couldn't care less about the United States. Other than when the World Cup's on and, and it's their team up against the U.S. in soccer. And so if you're this goat herder and you want to claim some sort of recourse against the people who have caused this destruction in your village, your options are pretty limited. There are no courts that you can go to that will take your case because as far as any international bodies are concerned, this is a, an act of war. And because wars are considered special, for the most part, these acts of violence can't be challenged in any sort of court system. Another option that person could consider might be to join their military and try to go up against the United States military. But of course, as I said, because the power of the United States military is so dis disproportionate to anything that a third world army could hope to achieve, that would be a pretty pointless exercise. Right. Let's, let's say you manage to take down that drone the next time it comes around. Does the U.S. government really even blink an eye? They just charge the taxpayers a little bit more next year and build a new one. A third option might be to engage in some kind of guerrilla warfare where if you do have an invading force in your own nation, you're not going to go up against them head to head, but you might find ways to attack them unconventionally, such as roadside bombs or car bombs or other things like that within your own country that are targeted at this invading or occupying force. And a fourth tactic that someone might use especially if they've become frustrated with anything else that they've tried, is to try to do something more extreme. And for this purpose, they might try to find other people who are just as frustrated as they are and create some sort of an organization that can pool its resources together to do something bigger. The strategy that some of these groups might attempt is to initiate violence on the soil of the country who they regard as an invader of their country. The usual reason that's given at least in the media, for why groups are motivated to do these sort of things is as a publicity stunt to gain more support for their own cause. It's hard to believe that these people really think that the U.S. government is going to stop what it's doing just because they've caused some damage and killed a few people, as callous as that might sound. Yeah, I don't think any of these terrorist groups expect that some terror attack that they instigate is all of a sudden going to have U.S. military turning tail and leaving all of their countries which may be what they ultimately want, but I can't imagine that they think that that's going to be a realistic effect of any attack. One of the real motivations behind these actions, of course, the simplest one is, is just plain and simple revenge or um, retaliation. Simply, you know, they've caused damage to us, we're going to go over there and cause some damage to them, which again is not far off from the U.S. response to certain terror attacks. To the extent that there is a more strategic motivation one of these would be simply to show that they're able to cause some damage to this invading force, which could help to rally some other people to join them and assist in their efforts in their own country. Another reason might be to demoralize the American people to the point where they say enough's enough and demand that the government actually pulls out of these other countries. That's right. Uh, the terrorists probably know that they won't be able to change the minds of military leaders by their acts of terror. However, they may be able to affect the thinking of the citizens of that country, who they believe to have some kind of control over their government in a democratic system. Right, and so this is another somewhat more subtle problem with the democracy, where any action the government takes is regarded as the will of the people. And so if the attacker feels justified in attacking the U.S. military, then they feel equally justified in, in attacking U.S. civilians. So to an extent, a system of democracy could essentially put a target on people's backs, even if they didn't support the government actions. <laughs> 
So to put all of this in perspective, of course we're not condoning any violent attacks that are an initiation of force, whether they're by terrorists or the U.S. military. But when we try to understand what motivates somebody to take such extreme measures as a terrorist attack, let's revisit the same question that we've been asking for each of the other scales in a slightly different way. If a democratic country had voted to attack your neighborhood and your whole family was killed in an explosion from a missile dropped out of the sky, would you take up a gun and go attack the government and people of that country? So there's a fundamental contradiction between what people regard as legitimate actions for an individual and what they regard as legitimate actions for the government. We've had a look at the way this plays out at each different scale of the built environment and have attempted to show that even in a democracy where everyone is supposed to have a fair say, there can be some significant imbalances and some questionable uses of force. And the problem with this perception of perfection is that when something is perceived to be perfect, it stops being questioned and the results are accepted as a result of a fair system. This causes people to become complacent and to stop looking for alternative solutions that might be better and might be achievable without the initiation of force. In the next episode, we'll start to investigate some nonviolent or anarchic approaches to solving some of the problems that arise in society. We'll revisit the scales framework once again. Yeah, hopefully for the last time. <laughs> but the question we'll be asking in that episode is, what would individuals do if they chose not to rely on the government to achieve their ends? That's the theme of this whole podcast, is to explore and flesh out some alternative solutions and hopefully some interesting speculations on the kind of world that we could be living in if uh, people would stop pointing guns at each other. 